Good morning, church. Welcome to our time of worship together. We're so grateful that you've chosen to be with us in worship today at all of the home campuses of First Methodist Waco, both here in McLennan County, around the state, and I know even around the world. We would love to know that you're worshiping with us today, so if you would, gather up your family uh, around your computer, around your TV, around your device. Uh, Register your attendance. You can do that on our app by letting us know that you're here. You can also share any prayer requests that you have, both on our app and on our website. We encourage you to make use of those portals to do so, so that we can be praying for you, so that we can be praying for your family. We hope this morning, as As you are gathered together in worship, that you will open up your hearts and open up your voices and sing your praise to God. Join us as we pray, as we speak out uh, our faith and our belief in the Word of God. We hope that you will participate in the worship of God right there, wherever you are this morning. Friends, it is a great time, any time. To lift up the worship of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our King. It's in His name that we're gathered together. And it is for His glory that we gather for this time of worship on this great day. Won't you open up your hearts and your minds, your voices, as we lift them up before the Lord, our Maker, and join our song before Him together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And as we come to our time of worship this morning, it is time to affirm our faith together as we recite the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Now, church, as we come to our time of prayer, please note that you can give us your prayer request online if you would like as we continue to pray for one another and our world. Let us go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, we come before you this morning thankful for this time to come together and to worship you this morning. From homes across our city, across our county, and across our world, we praise your name this morning. And as we come, Father, we come thankful for this time. We also come, Father, with joy in our hearts as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And so, Father, as we come, we also come with burdens and cares and concerns that weigh us down. So we ask that you would be with those who are suffering this day, those who are in need of, of health and of wellness Father, we pray for the health care professionals this morning. We ask that you would be with them as they administer healing to many. Give them wisdom. Give them discernment. Give them peace. Give them patience. Give them perseverance and strength during this time. Father, we pray for our congregation scattered across the city. We ask that you would be with them, that you would meet each need, that they would feel your presence and your peace beyond understanding, that they would be a light to the world in their neighborhoods and around this city. Father, most of all, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, the one who bore our sins on the cross, but who is alive and who has risen from the grave. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame. touched me and now I am no longer the same he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole since I met this blessed Savior since he cleansed and made me whole I will never cease to praise him I'll shout it while eternity rolls he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me
You know, there's a lot of new vocabulary to keep track of these days. Uh, COVID, Zoom, um, the new normal, social distancing. These are uh, words that have popped up into our vernacular that overnight have become part of our regular conversation. And I've been thinking a lot about this idea of normalcy because like many of you, uh, there's a part of me that's yearning to get back into what's normal. And as I've been thinking about uh, this idea of normalcy, of the new normal, of getting back to normal, all of that stuff, I, I've been trying to unpack what normal really is and, and what it is that I miss about the old normal and what it is that we are gaining in the new normal. New normal refers to this cataclysmic cultural shift where our very norms of existence have changed so fundamentally uh, that our lives are forever altered. I think we're in one of those moments, a, a recalibration of what is normal. As I think about what I miss about normal, I'll confess there are a few things like uh, I miss just rubbing my face all the time. I, I had no idea that I touched my face so much until... Uh, this new normal, and I just want to go back to where I can touch my face all the time. I also miss uh, this of normalcy. I miss going into um, Mexican food restaurants and sitting down at greasy tables and eating unlimited quantities of chips and salsa. Takeout Mexican is not the same as dine-in Mexican because when you eat all the chips and salsa that they put in your package, then what? Then what? The whole experience is about sitting down and eating as many chips and as much salsa as you possibly can before the food arrives, and then being half full by the time it does, and eating it all anyway. Uh, takeout Mexican is not the same, because you don't just feel like you're going to have to roll out away from the meal after you eat it. And so uh, touching my face, dine in Mexican. There are some things in normalcy that I truly miss. But in general, let me just say that I'm not sure that normal isn't overrated, especially for us as Christians. I think that normal gets overrated. Uh, status quo, equal, on par with everything and everyone else gets a bit overrated by society and the world. I think that as people who follow after God, people who are disciples of Jesus Christ, can recognize that a normal life is overrated because God has more than normal for us. He, he has extraordinary for us. He wants something more than normal for you. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to take the opportunity to examine some of the great biblical stories of things that are absolutely not normal and the ways in which God works so wonderfully in the lives of the people who live anything but normal lives. And the opportunity that we have to participate in the same if we make some of the same decisions that those heroes of the Bible made as well. And so one of our uh, most familiar passages in the Bible, it's one that we start learning from the time that we are children, is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who get thrown into the fiery furnace. So let's take a look at Daniel chapter 3. Uh, Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 30, tells the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into the fiery furnace. So take out your Bible, uh, wherever you are, take out your Bible, open it up, to Daniel chapter 3. If it takes you a little while to find it, what's great is you can press pause while you do. Just kidding. That was me pausing, not you. Okay, here we go. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Now, this story begins normal. 
This is not an abnormal or irregular type of event, not in this day, nor is it really even abnormal in this day. Uh, People are regularly setting up idols that they expect and want other people to worship. Whether that idol is a statue of gold or whether it's a standard for uh, achievement in the world or a, a, a level of prosperity, uh, a type of house or neighborhood or car that you drive, people are constantly setting up idols that they expect others to come and to worship. So we're, we're still in the realm of normal right now. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O people, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship immediately will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Here again, we see normal. This is going to be the cultural normative, and if you don't follow it, there will be consequences. This is going to be our cultural norm that we've created, that you are to worship something that is of value to me because I've set it up and because it represents your your tribute, your worship to me, and if you don't do that, there will be consequences consequences. We see this in the world today. If you don't worship the values that get promoted out of Hollywood, then there's something wrong with you. If you don't worship the cultural norms uh, of of this direction or that, then you get ostracized. Okay, it, it goes on. So we're still in the realm of normal here. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, uh, John, we need more zither. Can we get just a little more zither in our traditional worship around here? Uh, Okay, Uh, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now here again, also normal. This is normal behavior. If someone tells you, if you don't worship a golden image, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace where you are going to be consumed and your life will end. What is a normal person going to do? What is the normal reaction to being told either do this or die? Well, the normal reaction for most normal people would be, of course, to immediately do it. Hey, what does it hurt? I'll just bend my knees. I I hear the zither. I hear the lie. I hear the flute. I'm just going to bit down on it and I'm going to worship the Lord. That's normal. We're still in the normal workings of the world in Nebuchadnezzar's day and even in our day today. At this time, some astrologers came forward to denounce the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing fire. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, this also very normal. This is the way that the world works. There were some people in Nebuchadnezzar's court who held some level of authority and power over the court and the kingdom. And they were jealous of some of their peers that likewise who had some authority over ruling the affairs of Babylon. And so they said, hey, you know, king, you're glorious, you're wonderful, your decrees, they're all perfect, everything you do is right, everything you do is good, and you have said everyone should bow down and worship this image, but did you know there's some people who don't? Did you know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who you set over some of the affairs of the province of Babylon... They're not doing it. And then not only do they come forward to to report these guys, but then they kind of put the the little lie in there. They over-exaggerate the case. King, they don't listen to you 
at all. They don't even hear your voice anymore. They refuse to take any instruction from you. Can you believe it? Uh, Obviously, they don't respect your authority, your leadership at all. So not only do they come forward to say, hey, there's this group of people over here who are oddballs. They're different. They are abnormal. And so they need to be thrown into the fiery furnace. But what's more, uh, they exaggerate. They overstate the case. They, They get the king's attention. They grab his ear. And then they ostracize, criticize those who are standing apart from the worship of this cultural icon in Babylon. This, too, is normal, and so is the thing that happens next. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I've set up? Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Still in the realm of normalcy. In fact, this is painfully normal. What we read here is a man with authority over the flesh, a man with authority over the temporal affairs of of human events. He does have the power even of life and death over all of his citizens. And he is furious with rage because here are three guys who come from Jerusalem who are Jews that he conquered. He, his army overwhelmed the defenses of Jerusalem. He captured these people. He brought them back to Babylon and settled them there. So not only did he spare their life, but he gave them a settlement in Babylon, and then he gave them a position of leadership inside of his government. And yet they're not worshiping him for it. They're not recognizing Uh, his authority, his power over their lives. And so he's furious. You can understand. He might think, you know, I'm the one who saved your life. I'm the one who put you into this position of leadership. I'm the one who is your benefactor, and you're refusing my command. I'm just going to tell you right now, there's no God who is able to save you from my hand. He's laboring under the impression that because in the normal scope of affairs, he has power in this world that there is no God that can rival his strength. That is unfortunately normal in the world. Uh, People who accumulate great worldly power and possession start to believe um, that they are in fact God because they have some God-like powers like the ability to decide who lives and and who dies, uh, whose life is worthy uh, of life and whose life is not worthy of being lived. Um, That's unfortunately normal. But what happens next is decidedly not normal. Here's where we begin to discover that normal is overrated. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. In this matter, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Church, this is decidedly not normal. It stands apart from the normal order of human affairs for someone to stand up against unjust and corrupt authority and say to them, listen, you have the right to make your unjust laws, but I'm not going to follow them. And what's more, 
I am willing to bear the consequences of that. I'm willing to say that I'm going to stand up for what is right. And if you choose to exercise your authority over my life, so be it. I trust a power greater than yours. And I'm going to follow him. And then they do something that's extraordinary. And I want you to pay attention because it's part of our call in, in living abnormal lives. Number one, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they put their full faith and trust in God. That's what we need to do as well. And we need to do it today. You and I are living in a world that has been flipped upside down. The, the norms of our society, the norms of our culture have been turned upside down. And yet, we don't have to be flipped around. Because in the old normal, we were called to put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And in this new normal, we're called to put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. In both cases, we find that normal is overrated. Living in fear, living in doubt, living with anxiety, living without hope, uh, that's overrated. Living in wonderful trust of Jesus Christ. Living in the, in the faith and the belief that God can and will do more than what is expected it, it is abnormal, and it is what we are called to. Now, the second thing that they did, which was, again, extraordinarily abnormal, is this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this moment said to Nebuchadnezzar, look, even if God doesn't, save us, which we believe he will. But even if for some reason he doesn't, that's okay too. Because we would rather die faithfully than live unfaithfully. In other words, what they're saying is, Nebuchadnezzar, we would rather lose our physical life than lose our soul. Now, friends, that type of courage in the face of of raw persecution is decidedly not normal. I see people in the world today, uh, and we have throughout all of human history, who are willing to give a lot for a lie. Um, they're willing to, to build constructs of false gods and, and false icons that we're supposed to pay money into, that we're supposed to worship, that we're supposed to give credit to, but if it comes to the point where they either have to hold on to that belief at the cost of their life or let it go, most of them are going to let it go. Why would you be willing to die for something that you yourself know is a lie? And so these guys were willing to say, I would rather lose my physical life than lose my soul, lose my relationship with our God. And so Nebuchadnezzar, do what you have to do. You, you can choose to throw us into the fire, but you cannot make us worship anyone or anything other than the one true God. That, that is our commitment. Now, that's decidedly abnormal, and yet it is also instructive for us. You and I have the opportunity, the ability to live in a way that says we trust God with our souls. That whatever happens to these bodies, whatever happens to these mortal frames, our, our soul, our life is intact. Our eternity is intact because our God has already defeated the grave. Death could not hold him down. But because Jesus rose from the grave into new and everlasting life, and because he has invited us to participate in that resurrection reality, then there is nothing not even this physical body that we would not give to maintain our relationship to him who saves us. This is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say. You can do with our bodies what you like, but we will never stop being faithful to our God. What a powerful testimony and witness. 
it, it, it reminds us how overrated a normal life really is. These guys were extraordinary. They were living an extraordinary life. What they knew with some certainty is that it was not Nebuchadnezzar who saved them in Jerusalem or who gave them favor in Babylon or who had dominion over what the outcome of their lives would be. Rather, they knew that all of that was held in the hand of their God. Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent that the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. This is not normal. Uh, Normal is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound up and thrown into the flames and consumed by the fire, set ablaze in a painful death, but That's not what happens. Normal is not being fireproof, and yet somehow these guys find themselves resistant to the flames. And now here's something that's fascinating to me. Nebuchadnezzar intended the fire uh, to, to burn them up, to be the end of their life. And so he had them bound. He, he had them tied up, hands and feet, and thrown. They just t- toppled over into the fire. And what he intended uh, to, to bring an end to their lives, b- because they weren't willing to obey him, God used to set them free. You see, this is the way in which God works that is not normal. God takes the things that this world would used to destroy us, to harm us, and he uses those same exact experiences to set us free. What we see is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are not bound, but in fact, those bonds that were putting them in slavery to the king have now been burned off. And they're able to walk and to move about, and what's more, even as Nebuchadnezzar can recognize the reason for it, is the presence of God with them in the fire. Church, God makes his presence known in the midst of the trials and the tribulations that are normal in this sin-filled, broken world. We, We try to normalize the experience of all of this isolation and social distancing of uh, of sheltering in place. But, but the truth is, it doesn't matter if we are assembled in this grand sanctuary with thousands of people or whether we're in ones and twos and fours and fives in our homes around our devices. God shows up. He makes his presence known in the midst of normalcy. And he calls us to live these extraordinarily abnormal lives. Made so because he makes his presence known and available to us. What happens next, again, is not normal. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach! Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and the royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. 
nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The king recognized that there was a power greater than his at work in the lives of those men. And so he chose to give glory to the God who had saved them. He he chose to align himself with the God who was more powerful than the power of the furnace that he had heated seven times past its normal setting. What's more, God used that moment of trust and faith and faithfulness, that moment of willing to martyr themselves for their belief to bring systemic change in the world to recalibrate people's understanding of normal itself. All because three men were willing to die for their faith and trust that God would rescue them from the flames. When they came out of the fire, not only were they unharmed, they didn't even bear the smell of the smoke of the furnace. There was no evidence in them or on them at all other than the absence of their bonds to show they'd ever been in that fire. God carried them through and used them to be a witness and a testimony to the world to reset what normal would look like. And God does the same today through you, through me, through people who choose to root and ground themselves in their Christian faith as taught in the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, to live out a life that is singularly focused on obedience to Jesus Christ and to no other. Recently, I was moved by uh, the story of a, 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 perhaps a modern-day Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego. Uh, there was a man named Ahmed who was trapped in the basement of a building that had collapsed in Aleppo. He was there with about 170 other people, and on uh, the fourth day after the collapse, uh, everyone was hungry. Everyone was thirsty. Um, There was only one exit out of the basement, uh, one egress from out of that confined space in which they were trapped. And any time anyone tried to make a dash out of it, they were immediately cut down by sniper fire. And on the morning of the fifth day, Ahmed woke up in the middle of the night in that strange moment between sleep and, 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 and wakefulness, that twilight of the mind. And in that moment, Jesus came to him and appeared to him in a vision, in a dream. He said to him, Ahmed, I want you to get up and immediately go uh, to the exit and open it up and walk outside and you will find there bread and water that you can carry in to feed your family and those who are trapped with you. He was afraid. Uh, He knew that people outside were waiting to take his life because he was a Christian living in Syria. He had heard the report of the rifle and heard the the dropping of bodies each time someone tried to venture out because of their desperation. It must have taken such incredible faith for him to stand up from the place where he was lying to take those staggering steps towards the door, to reach out and to put his hand uh, on the doorknob and and to turn it and to 
open it up as the first rays of sunlight came streaming through. What it must have took for him to push open that door and, and to step out, blinking into the sunlight, listening, worrying, trembling, wondering if, if the rifle would report and it would be the last thing that he ever knew. And yet, he, he got up, he moved to the door, he opened it, he stepped outside and he found bread and water sitting outside. And he picked it up, he backed back in and closed the door and shared the water and the bread. And every day, from that one until Aleppo was liberated, Jesus would appear to him at a particular time of the morning. And he would get up and he would go out and there would be bread and there would be water. And it was only after the city was liberated and he and the others inside were able to go out that they realized the total devastation, loss of life that had taken place on that street where he had continued to go out and reach for the water and the bread as the street was covered in the bodies of dead Christians. Friends, that, that happens today, right now in the world in which we live and occupy today. Idols are set up. People with unjust motives in their hearts are given authority over the lives of human beings and they use it to bring destruction and war and poverty and oppression. And in the midst of all of that, there are people who choose to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. There are people who choose to say, you can do what you will to my body. But my life belongs to Jesus Christ, and in him I have trust. To a degree, you and I are experiencing an opportunity very unlike any known in American history to stand up for our faith, to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ in the face of hardship, of, of economic strain of, of a spreading virus that we cannot see, we cannot touch, that is reaching out and laying hold of our loved ones, that is flipping our world upside down, you and I have the opportunity to reject normalcy, to say, you know what, it's overrated. Instead, we are going to do what we have always done. We are going to double down on our trust and faith in Jesus Christ because we know that come what may, our hearts, our minds, our lives are secure in Him. Friends, fireproof is not normal. Uh, standing up for your faith in the, in the face of persecution is, is not normal. Putting your hope, your trust, your faith in, in someone greater than yourself, allowing someone other than yourself to be the God, the ruler of your life, it's not normal and it is what we are called to do because the truth is normal is overrated. As we continue in this ever-changing time, my prayer for us is that like our biblical heroes of old, we would find that God works in miraculous ways in the midst of extraordinary circumstances as we hold on to our faith and trust in Him. God bless you all. And God bless First Methodist Waco. sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each And I know that 
that it's the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us, filling us with your love. our hearts in praise without a doubt we'll know that we have been revived when we shall leave this place this morning we have heard the word of god that has talked about his faithfulness we have sung it together as well This morning, we celebrate the fact that God comes and meets us where we are, and he lavishes us with grace. And so we have this opportunity now to remind you that you have an opportunity to give. You can go to our website. You can go to the app. Uh, There's a chance for you to continue to be faithful in this time. We are the church, um, and we are continuing to be about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I know this because you are all over our city worshiping today in your homes. And so you have an opportunity to give. You can also stop by our church. You can bring a check by. Uh, our offices are open um, regular business hours, Monday through Friday. Um, but remember this, that, that we are the church. We continue to be faithful in all that we do, uh, complete in our discipleship. And you have an opportunity to, to re- Respond to the grace that God has given you today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we have heard of the goodness of God, that He pursues His people, that He makes a way, uh, that God's grace is real and present for everyone that would receive it. And so if you find yourself worshiping with us online today and you're ready to make a decision to to come into a relationship with this Jesus that you've heard about today, we invite you to contact the church to let us know. Uh, The pastors would love to have a conversation with you. We know that these are interesting days, but we also know that the gospel is still real and for all people. And so if you're ready to make that decision, please let us know that today. If you find yourself in a Sunday school class, uh, we, we invite you to continue to meet. If you want to know how to meet, how to connect with your Sunday school classes or your community groups, we, we are here to help you with that. If you are not in one and would like to join one, please contact the church. Let us know. Go to the website. Go to the uh, app. Uh, update your information on the website so you can make sure that you're getting all of the info that you need from the church at this time. My friends, we are so excited about what God is doing, even in the midst of these unprecedented times. We know that he is on the move. As we close worship today, I want to invite you to pray with me. Holy God, we bless your name and we give you thanks that you never leave us and you never forsake us, that you join us in our celebrations, that you join us in our sufferings. And so this morning, as we have heard the word of the Lord lifted up, We ask that it would be written on our hearts, that we would be worshipers of you in all that we do from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep. Lord, may you be glorified in the hearts and the lives of your people. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.